Yeah. Uh, so uh, 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 all right. All right. How you guys doing? Okay. How was Easter? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you celebrate Easter? You know, the, the new friend was really bad. No. My neighbor gave a present. You get a present? Yeah. Oh, Easter, yeah, for your son. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Good. Okay. Good. 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 Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. 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 <laughs> yeah, no, that's yeah. Yeah. And for GJ's takeout. She'll watch some TV. Probably when Hey, then you gotta do something for the video. It's gonna be mutiny. Yeah. You don't we, do did, right, we did the basket thing and did that in the morning, but I was like, we can't ask them, but <laughs> <laughs> don't feel bad. Okay, um, so real quick, uh, some uh, admin notes, all right? So I got anybody's draft. Okay, when anybody had a chance to look at their feedback. So uh, just in general, across the board, all right, there is a, you know, the, the plagiarism checker also has an AI checker, okay, the chat GPT. Checker. Okay. So it identifies who's used AI, enable stuff. Okay. And as a general note, you shouldn't have anything more than maybe 5% of your paper generated by AI. Okay. If it's more than that, go back in, see my notes, uh, see my feedback, make sure that you get into that under that requirement. Okay. That's that's basically what it boils down to. If you submit your paper and it's anything above five percent, then you're gonna get an F. That's the bottom line. Okay, um, just because it's it's the same thing as plagiarizing at the end of the day. And if you gotta do your own work, it needs to be original and unique. Understand that some content definitely, you know, will be used, right? And just sometimes it just come on, Antonio. It's just one way to say something, and you really can't change it up and it sounds perfect the way it is. So I definitely there's leeway for um you know some content being um, used. Uh, so let me repeat myself. Come on in folks. Let's close the door and get this uh, still going. I was telling the class if you have um when you submit your final draft or any draft or any paper for that matter, keep the AI used to a limit. Okay, anything above five percent AI generated content, you're gonna fail. Okay, automatic F, right? That's plagiarism. At the end of the day, you did not create it. AI did Chat GPT or whatever the case may be. You created that. Okay, I understand that you can use it to supplement your writing, and you can use it to you know kind of promote and provoke some thought, but you can't use it a hundred percent. For your paper, that is not acceptable in any sense of the word. Okay, yes. Uh, so, uh, I do this. Uh, this is my first semester. Mm -hmm. in the day. So, I uh, I said on Google about the final paper drop. Yeah. Uh, of our final paper, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the methodology, the methodology. Okay. So, I take the the form of that mm -hmm. and I replace. Some of my idea in the uh, in the form. 
Mm -hmm. So, uh, is that? Uh, yeah, I just want to make sure that's not acceptable. So, no, so, that. So if you so go ahead, finish, finish with you. Go ahead, finish your question. Yeah. Uh, so I take the form, I replace with my uh, resources, mm -hmm. I add my resources, and I replace uh, just my my idea in the form, my advantage and disadvantage. But keep the form is like from that. Uh, from the website. Okay. The, the total form of the final data. So I should to take it like uh, all of mine, even the form. How to the, do it. When you say the form, when you talking about the, the structure right. of the paragraph? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the suggestion, you should be able to set that up pretty easily as you write. You just make sure you set your paragraph. So as far as the form, when you, are you talking about like, you know, um, Introduction, lit review, like breaking it down like that, mm -hmm. or are you talking the actual form of the structure of the paragraph? Like a paragraph has, you know, my first paragraph, right? Five, six lines, it's paragraph one, yeah. right? And paragraph two. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Okay. So the format of it, no, the format of it is fine. You can take whatever template you want to use, but that's pretty universal across the board. It's going to be a format paragraph, five to six sentences, and each paragraph is going to have a break in between. And you know, the depth structure is is not a question. What is the concern? The content. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The content. No, you have to. You have to do original. Content. I, I was thinking that I should take the research methodology, mm -hmm. methodology from the internet, and uh, I uh, like I adjust on it. To do my own, uh, my own like just uh, uh, justification. No, no, you can't do that. No. So you can, you can, you can read. It's like any other research. You read the research, you synthesize it, and you put it in your own words and thoughts, right? And then after that, you try to connect it to what you're trying to um, support, right? Your idea. But to put a sentence into chat GBT and say, hey, talk about original development or the change theory, and it gives you, spits you out five, six pages, and then you take that and just pop it on there and say it's mine, that doesn't work. Can't do that, right? So you can you can pull the material out from chat GPT or any other open AI source, but once you get it, you probably need to go in there and read it and say, okay, what do I need to change? Right, I understand using it as a as, as a template or as a um as just a, a a start a place to start from, right? Yeah, but you have to go in and you got to make it your own words. It can't be the words of the AI generated thing or somebody else's word. You can't cut and cut and copy, copy and paste. Excuse me. You can't copy and paste and just put it on the paper and say it's, it's mine. Right? Did you have a question? Okay. Okay. Um, so you, you can't do that. So I can't. Um, I'm free with my paragraph to say what to say. I should just like do the result, the something like this. So yeah, I, you should use the you should use the format of a regular research paper. Yes, introduction, lit review, you know, methodology. You know, the, the format doesn't change. The words, the content changes. Right, the content is what I'm concerned about. You should not be using content that you did not generate yourself. What you should be doing is, okay, I know what I want to read. I know what I want to talk about. You go, you research articles, right? Peer-reviewed articles. And you say, okay, this article is talking about what I want to talk about. This article also says a little bit somewhere along the lines or somewhere in the paragraph or somewhere in there that supports my idea. And then you start to build your content around those particular things, right? But you're not cutting and pasting what they said in paragraph one and then putting it there and then say, okay, that's my idea. I'm good to go, right? For you to do that, you'd have to take it, cut it, paste it, put it in there, but you have to go in and change a lot of words, okay? To, you know, make sure that it's it's unique in nature. Uh, so, Dr. Um, after last mm -hmm. question. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, now I messed up with my final paragraph. So, can I, like, change some ideas and see if it's, like, uh, like a normal thing or it's, like, in the Right way. You're, uh, you're con you're what you're writing about? No, I, I, just, uh, I will rewrite everything. Okay. 
And I will think if that's okay, so I, I don't want to lose all the final paper. You're not going to lose all the final paper. The final paper is not due till week eight. Yeah, this yeah. is the draft. So what I recommend is that you work on your paper and make sure it's good to go for week eight because the final draft is done. It's 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 yeah, over. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure that I'm on the right way. So I can back and send it to you on an email. Yeah, you can, but all you gotta do is not plagiarize. Don't don't copy yeah. something, just write it yourself. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That, that's that's all it is. I'm not gonna have any new information or you know, if your topic hasn't changed, what you're writing about hasn't changed, then there's nothing for me to look at. It's just the whole point of if you're using supplemental resources to write your paper, you have to make sure that you first don't just cut and copy, all right? Secondly, you don't use AI detection or AI uh, tools to write your whole paper, you know, 5% tops. And even that is kind of like pushing it, all right? And then you make sure you have citations. The problem with the AI when you use it is that the AI, it just, it's just pulling stuff from, everybody knows how it works. It's just pulling stuff from databases and it's compiling it faster than we can. That's all it's doing, right? But what it's not doing is putting in citations for you, right? It doesn't cite anything. It just gives you the, the content. You don't know where the content came from. You don't know who said it, how relevant it is. I mean, granted, for the most part, the filters and the parameters in the AI algorithm are set to be the most relevant and up-to-date information, but at the same time, the information may not be relevant to the United States. The information is pulling from maybe relevant to France or maybe relevant to England, or maybe relevant to the Middle East, but not necessarily relevant to what we're talking about in our dynamic here in the States, right? And what we're doing in the class. So you can't just use the AI, right? Part of the, the learning process or part of the thing about moving from undergrad to grad is that this is research-based. This is what this is the difference between undergraduate and graduate work. Is research, okay? You are actually setting up your experiments and you're doing research and you are trying to see the ideas that you're thinking about, do they make sense? Are they valid, right? Can they be generalized, right? Is there some commonality out there that you can provide insight to the existing body of work that wasn't there already, right? To go in and just have OpenAI do it for you is, is pointless, okay? And secondly, you're stealing somebody else's work, right? So it just, it just, it was pretty bad, okay? It was pretty bad, okay? Understand that, use it for, you know, some things and certain percentages. I, I was like, okay, I got that. But 100%, can't, can't do it, okay? Can't do it. So just a general rule across the board, don't use the AI, generated stuff to you know be the majority of your research right i understand it's a good research tool but that's it that's it right? yeah it's a research tool and don't you know like you have to have citations if you don't have any citations you're basically said giving me an f paper you have to cite there's no getting around citating citing your work right you have to give credit to where you pull the information from, where you referenced it from. It's, it's just not, it just doesn't work in academia, right? People get in trouble for that. People get their articles redacted and, and you know, depublished. And, you know, people go to, not jail, but they definitely get in a lot of trouble for stealing other people's work, right? Not giving them credit, right? It's like if you have an idea and you didn't copyright it, or maybe you did copyright it, and somebody said, oh, yeah, I'm going to take this idea. Sounds good. And then they try to sell it and they make money off of it. You're going to get sued. You're going to lose everything because you don't have the right to do that. Right? That's your content. That's your stuff. That's your creative juices. Right? I didn't come up with that. You did. So if I want to use it, I should probably pay you a little bit something. Right? I should pay you some respect, some tribute, something and say, hey, you know what? I like this. Can I use it? It's not mine. It's not original content that I created. Can I use it? Sure. Okay, but that's what we do on the site. That's why I'm very heavy on the site, on the siting, because if any of you decide to go on to the doctoral level, you are not gonna make it. The first class you take, you send turn in the paper with no citations, it's gonna be an F, and they're gonna drop you from the program. 
Okay, this school is very lenient on how they do plagiarism, but most other schools, come on in. Most other schools, the first time you get caught plagiarizing, they kick you out of the school. It's not another class, they kick you out of the school. Okay, go to Harvard, go to Duke, go to you know SESU, go to USD, UCSD, they will kick you out in a heartbeat. You know why? They don't need you. They have 40,000, 50,000 students waiting on a wait list to get into the school. Okay, they'll make plenty of money. Right? They don't need the headache. And they have teachers there who actually wrote the books that you're using in class. So imagine you try to plagiarize a teacher's book, right? Or teacher's work, right? You don't know who these a lot of these guys, you know, Dr. Sherman, all these guys, Harvard guys, you know, they do a lot of research, a lot of writing, a lot of publication. Next thing you know, you cut and paste somebody's stuff. You think, oh, I'm gonna cut and paste any readers. Like, well, this is mine, right? It's, 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 I've seen it happen. It happens, right? You, 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 you think you think like, oh, it's a big school. There's 400 people in the class. They're not going to notice. They notice, okay? So as a rule, this is what graduate work is about. It's about research, putting the time in to make sure you do original work, right? And unique work, right? And it's like, like I said, it's okay to use the tool, but you have to go in and Use it as a tool, not use it as your primary source of research. Okay? So make sure go back, read all my notes. Okay? Doesn't apply to everybody. All right? Some people didn't use it at all. Some people used it a little bit. Some people used it all the way. All right? But I understand the intent. I know nobody here is trying to be malicious or trying to, you know, we're just trying to get a paper done. I get it. All right? But you have to be smart about it. Yeah, yeah, you got to you know, address it in a different ways. You just can't give it to me like that. No citation, no nothing. At least put some citation in there. Make it look like something, right? Can't, can't, can't do that, okay? So I don't want you guys to get kicked out of school, get kicked out of class, because eventually they will do that because the school is the one that gets in trouble at the end of the day. If we let you slide and don't do anything about it, the credibility of the school goes. And the rest of the credibility of the school goes, you know what goes next? Your degree. Your degree is worth nothing. If the school gets in trouble, where'd you get your degree from? CMU? Ah, they got in trouble last year. Yeah, that degree's crap. They just crap over there. They don't do, they don't follow the rules. They don't do things the right way. So we're not gonna hire you because you didn't get your degree from a good university. That's what happens at the end of the day. So I know that's that's a bigger picture thing, but that's essentially what it leads to. So that's why you just can't do it. Okay? Try to get on that? All right. All right. I'm not, you know, everybody looking all down and stuff. I'm not scolding you. I'm just, what, you want to make sure you guys understand, like, some of the ramifications that come with using this stuff. And I like to open the AI stuff, too. I'm an AI guy. I have a master's in AI. I understand. It's a great tool. It's very, all the stuff is fantastic. But the problem is that you don't learn anything if you use an AI, right? You're just busy cutting and pasting, and that's it. It doesn't, uh, doesn't bode well for education. It doesn't bode well for thoughts when we're sitting down with you. When you leave school, and you actually have to go out in the world, and they ask, hey, give me a report. I need you to write this report on a specific topic. And there's nothing in AI that's going to help you write about that specific topic because that information is only relevant to that client. You gotta know how to write it. Okay? You gotta know how to write it. All right, enough of that. Um, week seven, let's see. So, two more weeks. Um, so far, everybody's doing good. All right, I think everybody's sitting on an A, A minus for the most part. Okay, just keep it up. Two more weeks. Don't forget, week eight, Sunday, have your paper in. Okay? Have your presentation and the video that goes with it, right? So you can embed the, as long as, if you did the video, as long as the presentation is there, the PowerPoint slides, I can see them while you're doing your presentation, you don't need to submit an, an individual or a separate PowerPoint deck, okay? Just make sure you have your presentation, make sure you have your paper, and on time, 11.59. If something does come up, you got an emergency or something crazy happens, just send me an email, okay? It's sooner than later. Just let me know, hey, Dr. Case, I need a little more time or whatever the case may be. I'm behind. 
cool, no problem. Okay, I have a few days that I can work with you uh, before I have to turn the grades in because I have my own deadlines that I have to meet. So let me know if you run into any issue. If you want me to look at it before you submit it, do that as quickly as possible because I have a lot of other stuff going on and reading all the papers and trying to give you feedback, good feedback, is difficult in a short period of time, okay? All right. Um, aside from that, I don't have anything else. Who's Ramadan in? Two more weeks for Ramadan? Yeah, like 20, 20 April. When, when is April, Ramadan? 20, 20, 20. April 22nd. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, I think of anything else. All right. Any questions, comments? Anything? No? Week eight, last week. What's that? Week eight. What about week eight? That's next week. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's when we have We don't have any day. Okay. This is paper. Oh. Am I no, mistaken? I Do we have? No, I don't think we have a final here. Is there a final? No. There's no we final. We have a final. We don't have a week one, so we have a final. I don't think yeah. No, he told us about yeah. Well, look, I, I don't think there's a final, but I get confused sometimes in my other classes. So. No, you, you told us that we, we, we don't have a midterm. We don't have a midterm. We don't have a midterm, right? Yeah, yeah. Is is it on there? Yes, midterm. Is it on the on the portal? In the portal. Yeah, I'm check on the portal. Because we don't see because they don't open week eight. Yeah. Feel like oh, you guys can't important. see it at all. We cannot see it all. Week oh. eight. Okay, I'll check. I'll check where we're going to break. But I don't. I don't think you guys have a final. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I know. We what? We yeah. We have yeah. 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 So you so to, depends on the class sometimes whether or not you get a final exam. Um, so I'll take a look at it, but I'm pretty sure um, and at very least I need to get a final paper. So I mean, if you want to give us the points, no, no, <laughs> it's there, it's there. If it's there, it's there. Well, it's the grade, yeah, look on the grade. Look on the grade. You can do an organization change and change the final. Paper. Yeah, uh, <laughs> we're gonna keep we're gonna keep it right there. <laughs> Yeah, look on the grade um thing no, on the grade grade. There's no there's no grade grade for final exam, right? No, I don't. Think yeah, yeah. There is none because week eight is not open yet. Is that how it goes till till it opens? All right, I will check on it. Okay, there's okay. different opinions about what it is. Don't worry about it. Well, I'll get to the bottom of it. Not a big deal. Okay, well, a big deal for you, but <laughs> sorry, gotta be relatively sensitive. Okay, so. Today's class not going to be long, okay? Um, I want to go through this slide deck. Then there's two articles that uh, I want you guys to read and then kind of break up into two groups and then read the articles, discuss them, and then we'll talk about it and then we'll get out of here, okay? Okay, so we talked about, you know, doing our change and all that stuff, right? And then once we do our change, though, the problem is that, you know, how do we, you know, sustain the change, right? Uh, first thing we have to assume that whatever change we made and we implemented it was successful, right? Give or take, okay? Um, and how we measure that success could be in any different ways. It could be, you know, based on the return on investment. It could be based on the production number. It could just be based on, you know, the feeling, the, the change in tone within the organization. It, we don't know. And the other thing about the change is that usually, unless it's a, um, data driven or uh, sales driven type change, you usually don't see the change right away. It takes time to see the actual change within the organization. So you're not going to get an immediate turnaround or immediate, like, oh my goodness, that thing we just did totally just changed the game, right? Doesn't work that way. Unless it's a system, you know, something a little bit more tangible and concrete. If it's more a change of organizational culture based on some changes we made, um, that takes time. Changing personnel, that takes time to see. So you, you can't always measure your change right away. You have to be patient about it and not jump the gun, right? And so with that, that itself brings on some problems because there are going to be people that are going to be looking for answers as to whether or not the change was effective, okay? They want to know, like, the things that you put in place, 
they, they have some influence or some you know impact on what's going on or what the outcome is going to be or would be okay and so you don't want to get pressure into that because you want to go ahead and say hey look we made some changes it's going to take some time to develop we got to let them grow we got people that we're dealing with here and so people change gradually you don't change just like that okay so we have to give it some time right but Sustaining the change is probably the most critical aspect of the whole change management, right? It doesn't make sense if we implement this change and then we're good for a month and then the next month after that, we go back to what we did before, right? We want to be able to combat that and kind of, you know, mitigate what we call initiative decay, okay? And so when we're talking about initiative decay, we're just talking about an initiative is just something that we are trying to do, right? It's a goal or objective or a plan or some kind of mission, right? So we talk about initiative decay. We're really saying, okay, we had this plan. We had these changes. We implemented them. Um, they seem to be working just fine, but how do we keep it up there? How do we make that the status quo, right? How do we change it from a change or make it from a change to what we do on a regular basis, okay? What we want to hear is, um, yeah, we had to change, okay? And you want to hear is, oh, but this is how we always do it, right? That's that's kind of, that's how you know the change has taken place, really, right? When you go from, yeah, we have this huge change coming up, and then a couple months later down the road, someone says, yeah, but that's how we always do it, when they forget the old way, right? Or what things used to be like, okay? So we want to maintain that, because if we don't, all we're doing is losing money, Okay, we wasted money, we wasted time, right? And the problem is still there. Whatever that this issue is, is still there. And there's a number of reasons why we have initiative decay. Okay. One is, well, we got a whole list. Let me move on because I don't remember all, all of them, but okay. So, right, the first one that I really is important and I think that needs to be highlighted is when you have a change in the leadership, okay? When you have a change in the change uh, champion, right? When the person who was kind of the, 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 the driving force behind the change or the people that were the driving force behind the change leave or aren't paying attention to the change anymore, you start to see a lapse, right? It starts to go down, right? So if I'm the change manager or the change champion and I'm the one that was in charge of this whole initiative, and all of a sudden, I'm like, okay, cool. I made it happen. I put everything in place. I have another project I moved to, right? I'm hoping that the change can sustain itself, right? It can kind of be on autopilot without me. Because if I leave, which I'm going to because I have other things to do, right, just like everyone else does, I don't want the change to start to go down, right? I don't want the change to go away. It's like training or it's like, um, you know, it's like with the kids, right? You show them, they do something wrong, you tell them, hey, don't do that. It's, it's not the way you do it. This, you do it this way, right? And as soon as you turn your back, they go right back to doing it the way you told them not to do it, right? Because, of course, they're children, right? They're still developing. But two, they're familiar with this old way. It's comfortable for them and they like it, right? And so making them change without supervision they're not gonna do it, right? And so it requires a lot of, you know, consistency when it comes to maintaining the change, right? Or sustaining the change, right? Things have to be um, sort of routine and very rigid at the beginning, right? And then once everybody gets accustomed to the change and it becomes second nature, then we can kind of start loosening the reins as far as like, okay, I don't need you to do it, you know, specifically like this. I don't need you to go left, right, left, right. You can go left, left, right if you want, okay? But the essence of the change hasn't, hasn't really differed, okay? It hasn't varied any, right? But the leadership, when that goes, right, you don't want the, the change to go with it is really what I'm getting at, okay? And so the personnel is important, right? And this is one of the things that leads to initiative decay because now, oh, Big Brother's not watching. I'm going to do what I want. Okay, I'm going to go back to using the typewriter. I'm going to go back to going on three-hour lunch breaks. Okay, I'm going to go back to hanging out in the bathroom or smoking 20 cigarettes a day 
and not really being at my desk. I'm going to go back to surfing the web. I'm going to go back to, you know, stealing pencils or whatever it is people do in offices, okay? And so you don't want that, right? If you don't want to go away from it just because people aren't being supervised, they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, right? So that's one of the things that leads to change again, okay? Accountability, right? For the success of the change becomes diffuse, right? So now it gets to the point where I don't have anyone to point the finger at, sort of, okay? Something goes wrong with the change. Who do I, who do I blame? Who do I say, oh, you messed up? If it's one person or if it's a department, do I just blame the department? And if it, I do blame the department, who in the department do I blame, okay? The accountability, the ability for me to point somebody out and say, hey, you need to fix this, right? Or you need to fix him, her, or your whole team, right? Starts to decrease, okay? Once the accountability goes away, then people, again, are going to resort back to their natural tendencies, okay? And then in the day when we as human beings, right, we behave in a certain way, right? We have certain habits that we individually have, right? But... If we're not consciously trying to behave in a certain way, we just go back to our kind of primitive behavior, right? When we are talking about someone in the state of the situation where, like today, there's uh with the, you know, everybody know there was a shooting, another shooting today, right? In Kentucky, right? Five dead, nine people injured. It was a bank, okay? Yeah, so, um, Either way, what's your normal reaction if somebody comes in with a gun and starts shooting? Run, run, hide, right? Okay. There's only one, there's only two things you can do. All right. Anybody know what the two things you can do in that situation? Attack him. Attack him, right? Fight. Hold on. Fight or flight. Or fight or flight. Okay. Fight or flight. Right. So naturally, 99% of us are gonna take the hell off. We're gonna flight, okay? Especially if we don't have any weapons, we don't have anything. I haven't been to the gym in a week. You know, I'm not ready for this today, okay? I'm gonna flight, okay? But then other people, they're gonna fight because they, they've been trained that way, right? They kind of like their mindset is that way. Okay, and so they're going to stay there and fight, right? That is not necessarily their primitive or instinctual behavior, right? That's something they've garnered through training, okay? That's something where they've gone like, oh, okay, I'm used to this scenario, and I can, I think I can adapt to it. I can deal with it, all right? For me, I would not, I would not run, but I don't necessarily know if I would fight unless I had some resources. All right, but before the military, I'd be gone. Okay, I'd be out of there. All right. So what I'm trying to say is that without supervision, without training, without something in there, people are going to revert back to their natural instincts. Right, good or bad, and we don't necessarily want that. What I'm trying to do is implement this change. I'm trying to change your behavior. Right, but once you know, I'm gone or I can't, you know, hold you accountable. You're gonna go back to the way you were. Okay, that's just the human nature and thing. Okay, you're gonna go back to doing where you're doing things that make you comfortable. You're in your zone, right? Uh, it's kind of like some people are very social, others aren't very social. They're not good in, in public settings. They're not good with crowds and that kind of thing. Other people, you drop them off in a the crowd, they know everybody before you leave. They're friends, they got phone numbers, they, you know, they got a girlfriend, they got a boyfriend, whatever, in two minutes. Other people, they want no parts of that, okay? It's just not their natural tendency, okay? But being able to hold someone accountable and having someone to point the finger at is essential when you're trying to implement change, okay? Because somebody has to answer for it. It doesn't matter. Somebody has to answer for it. And if no one to answer for it, then it's just going to totally fall apart. Right, because nobody feels any sense of responsibility. It wasn't me. I think Jim had it. No, I think Judy had it. No, I think Rick had it. Oh, I don't know who had it. Okay, everybody doing their own thing again. 
right? So accountability is extremely important, right? Knowledge about the new practice is lost through turnover, right? So you have a change, people leave, right? And they take the corporate knowledge with them. Right? So now, guess what? You hire somebody new, and they have no idea what's going on because they weren't there for the change. Okay, so that needs to initiative decay. Right? You want to keep your core group as consistent um, as possible and stable as possible in unstable times. Okay, if that makes any sense, you want to keep the resources you have stable in unstable times because change is unstable. Right, change is unpredictable. That's what that's what that's the whole thing. That's the whole premise of it. Right, we're going through something that maybe we have gone through before, but probably not. Right, and we're trying to get to an outcome that we really don't know what it looks like once we get into it. Okay, but I don't want to have a roller or a carousel or a revolving door of people coming in and out. Right, I don't want to have people just leaving the company because of the change or just in general, okay? Because now I have to start over. It's like inserting somebody new on your team and now you have to explain to them what happened. Oh, it's kind of like um, when I first started talking in the beginning of the class and then you guys walked in, I had to start over, I had to relay the information again, right? And then hopefully you pick up on it, okay? You don't wanna have to do that because something's gonna get lost in translation. Something's gonna get lost in the continuity of it all. Okay, you want continuity and change, right? And so having these change in personnel um, never does well for the change as far as, you know, um, keeping or sustaining the change, okay? It, it's not good. All right. Um, old habits are employment from nuclear recruits from less dynamic organization along the same lines, okay? You hire somebody new. This is how we did it in my old company. Okay, great. This is not how we do it here. Right? I'll be the first one to tell you everything you learn in school is great, but when you get to your company, when you do your job, they're going to be like, forget about it, okay? Don't even, we don't do it that way. We don't, don't open the book. Don't tell me anything about a book. You're going to do it this way, okay? What does it look like? It's right for us, right? I don't care what the book says, right? I know, gap. You know, generally accepted accounting principles. Great. I know what the code says. This is how we do it. Okay. So you got to make sure that you understand that, right? That the um, some of the, the stuff that you're going to bring to the table may not necessarily fit for the organization you're going into in the way that you are used to doing things. And so you have to adjust. You have to say, okay, you know what? I know that. I used to do it this way, and they're doing it this way. As long as it's not illegal, it's just another way to do it, right? There's multiple ways to do everything, okay? There's no specific one way to just do an activity or an event or surgery or whatever the case may be, okay? Maybe there, uh, maybe there is for certain things. I'm sure there is for certain things. But, um, you know, in general, there's multiple ways to do stuff, and most corporations are going to have a different way of approaching the same problem, right? Because they have different resources, they have different uh, people that have different knowledge base, right? They have proprietary information, proprietary technology, things of those nature that influence or impact how they approach their problems, okay? Although it's the same problem across the board, we just don't do it that way, right? So you got to keep that in mind. The factors that are re the reasons for the change are no longer visible, right? So this is a, I would say this this one is is it kind of hard to defend just because if you can't see the reason for the change, then you are more likely going to be like, well, I don't see why we changed in the first place because whatever it is we're changing for is gone, right? It's like taking medication for a cold that you had last week. I was sick last week. Well, I'm taking some Advil today. You seem fine to me. Yeah, I, I do, but you know, I was sick last week. Okay, so I'm going to take some medication this week. All right now, there's nothing wrong with that because just because you don't outwardly, physically 
exhibit the symptoms doesn't mean you're not sick, right? You may have some internal congestion. You may have some internal issues that we just can't see. But on the external, you look fine, look okay, okay? And so you can't let that be an excuse for why we're not going to implement the change. Oh, the, the problem is gone. No, it's not gone. You just don't see it, all right? It still exists, right? But the fact that you can't see it doesn't mean that it's not there anymore. Right. And so you can't just drop the change. Right. You can't just say, you know, we're not going to do that anymore. We're good. Uh, everything's solved. And we're going to go home. OK, it doesn't work that way. Right. So you have to keep that in mind. You have to keep an eye up for people that are kind of doing that. Right. Who are saying, you know what, hey, the change is gone or the, the problem is gone. Let's go back to the way we used to do things. Right. Because we don't need that change anymore. Right. No. Right? So because you don't see it. And depending what level you're at, right? If you're middle manager, right? Maybe entry level manager, you don't see everything, right? You don't have the big picture. You don't have the whole picture. And they're saying, hey, this is the way we need to approach it. You probably want to just keep on path, keep on track, okay? All right, new managers want to drive their own agenda. This is where you have your one man teams, right? People that are just kind of like, I'm going to do it my way. And that's the way it is, my way to highway, right? That works for a little bit until you go to a meeting and that one manager has something different than everybody else. And then go, hey, did you not get the new template? Yeah, I got it, but I didn't really like it. And I just decided that it was easier for me to adjust the numbers on my own, on my own uh, spreadsheet. Okay. That's not going to work because your spreadsheet goes into a bigger pot, and we use all the spreadsheets to come up with this combined number. Now your spreadsheet is off. We can't merge anything together, right? It's kind of like uh, coding, okay, or interface, right? Different languages can't interface with each other. You have to have something in between that helps with the interface because the languages are the same, just like any language. One person speaks you know, Arabic, the other person speaks English, one speaks French. We have to find some common ground, all right? And we have to stick to it. You don't find the common ground or the common language everybody speaks, all right? For us, in this particular instance, is English. We all speak English for the, you know, as far as facilitating instruction, right? And facilitating dialogue, okay? But when you're in your own little groups or you're at home, whatever, you speak whatever language you want to speak, right? But if you came in here and spoke your own individual languages, we wouldn't be able to do anything. Okay. And that's basically what it is when you have somebody who's kind of doing their own thing, right? They have their own agenda. They may be trying to get uh, promoted. Okay. Or a lot of managers are very self conscious. They're afraid that you're going to take their job. I right? mean, you guys are running into that, right? Managers that are afraid that, oh, you know, I don't want. I don't want you really knowing too much because I'm afraid you're coming for my job, okay? It's silly. If you're doing your job well, you're fine, okay? And you want your employees, the people that work for you, you want them to excel, right? That's the, at the end of the day, if you have a good manager, they want you to develop and to grow, right? When I see you guys, I'm like, hey, I want everybody here to be better than me. I want you to have three PhDs. You know, you run your own company and do, you know, I'm not going to hold you back. If I see an opportunity and I think it fits, I say, hey, last year I saw something I think would be good for you, right? I would, I would tell you, okay? I don't have an agenda, right? The only agenda I have is to make sure that you get the most out of me when it comes to instruction and we talk and we, you know, learn as much as we can, give you some foundation that you can go out there in the world and, you know, do all the big things you're going to do and be great, okay? So you gotta watch out for that, all right? Those are supposed to change by biding their time, right? Create the opportunities that they emerge to undermine the situation, to change it. So this goes back to that person or people that didn't want to change in the first place, okay? They're stalling, it's gonna wait it out, right? It's gonna sit here, I'm gonna wait it out, and if I see him come in, I'm gonna duck, all right? If I see him come in, I'm gonna go to the bathroom. I know we're going to do this this day. I'm going to call in sick. Okay, stuff like that. Okay, they're just trying to stall because they think eventually the change is going to fail. 
right? And so why put the effort in to try to make this change when I know it's not gonna, it's not gonna work out, okay? When in all actuality, everybody else has adopted the change, everybody's doing it, except for one or two people, right? And so that is going to contribute to some initiative decay, right? Having those people that are really against the change and instead of trying to dig into the change and, and understand the change and what benefits uh, they can garner from the change, they're going to resist, okay? These are your resistors, right? And you have to really get those and identify those people very early on so you can try to figure out how do I change your mind? How do I get you to buy into the change, right? So let's not make any, you know, have any misconceptions. You don't have to like the change. Nobody's saying that, okay? But I need you to implement the change, all right? I don't like the change, but I'm pushing for it because it's gonna have a benefit at the end of the day. Is it gonna inconvenience me in some way? Am I gonna have some challenges going through the change? Yes, of course. I'm gonna have some issues going and dealing with the change, but at the end of the day, it's good. Okay, it's going to be better for us, all right? And so you have to understand that there's going to be people that are going to put up a fight, and you have to find those people very quickly, right? Because they will totally destroy your change. Okay? Again, one person is funny enough is can mess up your whole thing. Okay, ten seconds of your life can change it dramatically. All right? There's a lot of people in prison who are in prison because of ten second mistakes. Lost their cool five, 10 seconds instead of just calming down, relaxing, just breathing, just thinking about what it is they're really angry about. Yeah, I'm angry. I'm going to shoot you. I'm angry. I'm going to beat you. All right. Next thing you know, you're in prison. It's the next day. And you're like, why am I here? The guy stepped in my shoes and I beat him to death. And now I'm going to spend the rest of my life in prison for 10 seconds. Okay. Or one person. So one, you know, we individually have a huge impact on things, okay? So one person can make a big difference. So you want to make sure you kind of figure out who the people are, who the resistors are, to make sure that they don't impact the change in a detrimental way, right? Um, implementation funding runs out, and yeah, that's the kind of like above us, right? If they run out of money, no more resources, that's something, you know, it's like, all right, that's out of my hands, and that's some executive leadership or something that effect. And then in the day, if they ran out of money, we got other issues, okay? Aside from whatever the change is, right? Um, and if they decided to let the money run out for that particular initiative, then maybe it wasn't that important. Okay, that's, the, that's kind of the way I see it, right? If there's no funding for something, right? And then we're trying to change it and trying to implement certain things and the money runs out, probably means that it wasn't that important. Okay, um, and companies will fund things that they deem important, right? It's like anything else. If you think something's valuable or you want something, you're going to save money up to get that thing or money to, you know, go towards that thing. You're not going to give it up. And if you give it up, then you prioritize it to where, okay, it's not that important to me. I can do without or I can wait or I can do whatever, okay? So the funding issue usually... It's, it's kind of out of, you know, at the high levels and the priorities change. And once the priorities change at the top, at the end of the day, I really can't ask the employees or the workforce to make it their priority to put the change in place. Okay. This is kind of my thought on it. But um, you may have different opinions on that, uh, depending on what the change is. But again, once the money goes, the change normally goes with it. Okay. Because money is at the bottom. At the end of then money is it, all right? What's the bottom line? The money, okay? Is it generating revenue for us? Is that creating profits for us? No, great. We made the change, but at the same time, we're gonna cut off funding. This is the last year we're gonna fund this particular program. And so that's that, okay? And you see it across the board, everywhere. Government agencies, right? If all you guys are dealing with immigration and visa things, visa issues, right? Maybe you've noticed that your visa is taking a little bit longer to get processed or approved, or when maybe took a you know instead of taking six months, it took a year, right? Or maybe taking longer for certain things. That's because it's funding. There's certain programs that are being cut, 
right? Or minimize or 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 shorten, right? It's funding. The money's being allocated to something else. We're gonna take this million extra million dollars here that we had for immigration and customs and that kind of thing and education and visas, and we're gonna put it over here in defense. Okay, and you guys next year that program's cut. So you can't come to the US under that program. You can go to this program, but it's like how many people on that wait list? And so good luck with that. Okay. Um, new priority, time to talk about that. And then people suffer initiative fatigue. Okay. So people just at the end of the day just get tired. They just get um if you have too many things going, too many changes going, it's not good. All right. Change one, change two, change three. And then and within change three, there's four sub changes. And it, you don't want to do that, right? You want to focus on one thing and one thing only, right? Or maybe two things, depending on how big or small they are, and implement those things and then move on, right? You don't want to have keep it, keep having all these initiatives that pop up where we're cons in a consistent state of change. That's not good either. Because people have to set up some kind of um, normal routine, okay? We're very routine driven, right? I'm sure all of us here have a regular routine. Every day you do a certain thing and you go about your day in a certain way, right? I know I do. I have a routine that I like to maintain. And so if I have to deviate from that routine, I don't like it per se, because now I feel like I'm taking you know, time out of my day to do this thing when I didn't want to do it. It's not part of my normal schedule because I keep having these things pop up, right? Be it meetings, be it, hey, Dr. Case, uh, I need you to open, um, you know, LE5 for me, right? That's not in my day. I didn't plan for that, but guess what? Gotta stop my routine, go in, open it up, set the date, wait for you to do it, right? And then, when you don't do it, send me another email, Dr. K. I didn't see your email. And can I can you open it again for me? Okay, great. Now imagine you multiply that by 40 times. Okay. <laughs> and different LEs. One student wants LE3, another one wants LE5. You want LE6. It's a lot, right? So I got a lot of things going in, and not, now I'm not even doing what I normally do. I'm not in my routine, right? I'm not sitting at my desk typing or whatever, drinking my coffee, my tea, goofing off, whatever, all right? I'm, I'm taking care of business, all right, for whatever it is, all right? I just use you guys just because it's, it's fun, but you understand what I'm saying, right? You have to keep the initiatives at a minimum. You can't inundate people with constant change because they can't get into a routine, all right? They can't really um, start to visualize or kind of, um, make the, the change tangible because you're always make a new change we start at eight now we're going to start at 8 30. lunch was an hour now it's 30 minutes i used to be able to park here now i gotta park over there right it may not seem like a lot but there's a lot of changes right there okay and you don't want to do that to people all right, all right. any questions comments stories nothing all right I feel like everybody's like the first 10 minutes it's like Took it out of you guys, huh? Just, man. Oh, okay, I hope not. But I but I have you know that I can consider to have the final numbers. Well, I think what I've seen so far is that uh there uh, back then we we, we had um uh, well, the changes were that I I uh, anticipated and were not like General changes of the organization. So what what we did was that different departments went through some kind of changes. Yeah. Right. So yeah. Then and, and, and also uh, I, I would use our warehouse. Our warehouse is very at, at a given point. So uh, I was sent there to um, to this mine. Like uh, mm -hmm. the warehouse was when it was looking so weird, so weird that um, the, uh, the the way things are stored, the way items are stored, they're so not organized. Yeah. For example, the parking rules were just never the right place. So when I go there, I, of course, I faced some restrictions. Yeah. Where's management? So it was like, no, you can't do it. I mean, 
you want to take my job? So as it involved the um that box. Yeah. So it came in, spoke to him, he did it, he realized what we were gonna do and it's like you. So and somehow we we had this conversation to let's at the point we discovered that there is a particular guy in the team that is not gonna allow these changes to happen because he is elderly, yeah, he's a perfect being. And but we but 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 because of the change we're going to implement, this guy was going to be a, a problem for us because the manager, the warehouse manager, was scared to give the guy instruction. Right. And so, and I said, well, with this change, everybody needs, and, and everyone needs to follow the process. Everyone needs to uh, listen to the instruction. Mm -hmm. So it's either you talk to the man or you ask him to go. Yeah, that's it. It's yeah. difficult at yeah. first, but you know, as change, you're gonna go and have it. Yeah. Discover that this guy was not even fit. So, yeah, 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 we have to let him go. But it was there was a moment the guy left. The change that they come out. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. you have resistors in there. And typically, you know, age is one of the resisting factors, right? Because someone's been in the company 20, 30 years and they used to doing things a certain way, uh, certain techniques, certain, you know, equipment. And, now you're bringing, you know, this new stuff and you want to change it up and why? And it just, you know, older people, they just have a harder time grasping new technology and they don't want to change, right? Because for them, you're disrupting everything they know, right? And the longer they've been doing it, the harder it's to change, right? And so that's why usually older people get phased out of the workforce right? because they don't want to change. They don't want to, they don't want to accept that things are different. Um, and that you have to, if you want to keep up with society, you have to keep up with the changes, right? That's that's really what it is. If you want to be relevant, and some people don't necessarily care about that, they don't want to be necessarily relevant, right? Like I told you, my parents, I bought them an iPhone, useless. She just gave them two a string and two cans because they don't they don't like it. They don't know how to use it. They just don't want to learn. And so it's okay, great. You know, here's your flip phone back and have fun. Okay. So I understand that part, right? Then so we uh and I think there's a supply chain that I was gonna say that failed actually. Mm -hmm. uh, um yeah, the implementing change is great, everyone everyone can be combined, they can be they love the initiative, whatever they end up fine. But at some point, it just what disappeared? The change that we knew was that we knew that well, well, my thought is that why and how did you notice that the change in didn't go? Yeah, oh, because it um, we stopped monitoring it. So at, at the point, at the, so the moment the moment we implemented the change, mm -hmm. we stopped monitoring. We stopped following up. Stop being accountable. Yeah, no one's accountable, you know. So somehow, somebody was going back to it. Yeah, they, yeah, what are doing? Yeah. Nobody's watching me. Nobody's monitoring me. Nobody's no audit. No audit yeah, exactly. No audit. That's perfect, right? And that, that's a good point, right? Most changes, when you have change like that, money change for the most part, you will 100% for the most part have an auditing team or some auditing checklist. We do that in our company, which falls in the future funds. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. that's I, that's what you guys audit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So whatever auditing technique you got, it's you. There's an audit process, right, to make sure that hey, the change is happening, and that we know that we're being monitored. Even people know, like, we're being watched, right? And that's the thing. Sometimes you have to make it a deliberate, conscious thing. We're watching you. Okay. We're not hiding behind bushes. We're not hiding anywhere. I'm coming to tomorrow eight o'clock. And I'm gonna audit you, right? Sometimes you do mystery shopper, you know, that kind of thing to see, you know, how you behave when nobody's watching. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But it's an it's the accountability thing, right? At the end of the day, right? But that's a good point about the audit, right? And most changes have that, right? They have some kind of audit function at the end of the day that makes sure that hey, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, even when I'm not there, right? You're doing the right thing, and you find the procedures as outlined in the new protocols. And we appreciate it. Okay. And that's going to help with the company down the road. But you're right. It's going to be, it's always going to be a few, I wouldn't say five to 10% of the workforce is going to be resistance. 
and you're gonna spend most of your time trying to convince them. And the, the thing is, they're not, it's not like they all get together and they party. They all spread out. One is over here in marketing, the other one's over here in IT, the other one's over here in operations. You have to go kind of figure out like, okay, where are my lags in like fall, like uh, fallouts coming at, right? Where am I losing my traction, right? What's falling through the gaps, right? In what areas? And that's kind of where you have to really identify your resistance. But that takes time. It takes time, right? You just can't point to somebody and say, oh, I know you're a resistor. I know you. I see it. Right? So the real good resistor, they're not going to let you know. They're going to be hiding it. They go on the front, on the surface, they're going to be doing it. Looks like, yeah. Yep. All right. He's gone. Good. Go back to what I was doing. Okay. That's a good point. Um, okay. What time is it? 636. 636. All right. You got to go to break, break or you got to keep going? Keep going. Get out of here earlier. Take a break. See you a little later. Up to you. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Oh, keep going. All right. Okay. This is one of the few chances you get to be in democracy in this class. Okay. <laughs> Take advantage of it. All right. So, actions is the same chain, right? Redesign roles, right? Sometimes you have to get in there and move people around. Hey, I know you were in this role, but you're not really doing a good job enforcing the change. I'm going to put you in charge and you are going to move to something else, all right? Not necessarily demotion, it's just understanding where people's strengths are at and where people are at in the particular change cycle. Not everybody's going to be 100% full drive, full tilt the whole time during the change process. Sometimes people are going to hit walls themselves and they need a little break from the change. Right? So you pull them out and put somebody else in, in that particular role. Other times, maybe you want somebody to be exposed to being a change manager, right? Because it's going to help them with their professional development. Hey, I think this is a good position for you at this moment. It gives you leadership time. It gives you time to be a supervisor. It gives you time to see you know what change looks like, right? How managing change looks like, the budgets, the financial, the, the finances associated with it. You get to go and talk to each of the different departments, you get to meet people, right? And talk to the different areas. And it gives you an idea of how things are connected, right? So you may redesign the roles uh, for people. Okay. Redesign reward systems. That kind of happens, but not really. Okay. Once the reward system is kind of set up. It's very unlikely they're going to change it unless there's a really dramatic need for it. They'll alter it and say, you know what, we're going to give you, um, you know, I don't know, a thousand dollar bonus for every, you know, one percent or one tenth percent of deficiency rating that we go down. That's not really working, so we're going to make it two thousand. Okay, kind of like um, when you are. Um, you guys probably seen all over the place, right? But people, like FBI move on in this sort of, right? As you move up on the FBI list, the reward increases, okay? Because now that person, whoever it is, is the priority, right? They used to be at the bottom. Let's talk about like El Chapo. Everybody's familiar with El Chapo, right? Drug Lord Cartel, all that good, Sinaloa, Sinaloa, whatever, whatever. He used to be at the kind of at the bottom of the FBI work monitor list. And I think his reward was like $5,000 or something like that for information leading to his arrest. And at some point, he just gradually climbed the ladder when he became the number one person wanted on the FBI list. And the reward was a million dollars. Where's El Chapo now? In prison. Okay. Part of that is the reward. Okay. It's an incentive, right? Is it worth a million dollars to snitch on El Chapo? Sure, for some people, right? Not for me, but for some people, it's worth a million dollars, right? I'm gonna say, but for 5,000, would you snitch on El Chapo? No, not enough money, right? Because he's probably gonna send some guys to kill me anyway, okay? But for $5,000, no, but for a million dollars, I'll think about it, okay? So when you change the reward system, it's the same thing. At $100, I didn't think about I, the change wasn't really happening for me. At a thousand dollars, okay, I'll suck it up. I'll do it. 
because the incentive changed, right? The rewards changed, right? There's more, more in it for me that I can see up front, okay? And that's usually a problem with change is that people can't see the benefit in the long term. They want to see it up front, right? Pay me now. Give me my money right now. If I can see it up front, the change is typically more likely to occur, right? What you have to watch out for is you don't want to give the, the, the reward all at once, right? You understand what I mean? Because you give it all up front, it's like giving somebody, oh, yeah, build my house, right? How much is it going to cost? 500000 Let me write your check for 500000 Here you go. How do you think this house is going to take to be built? If you even get a house. Exactly. It's going to take forever, right? But if I give you 50000 now, the other 450 is waiting here. Every time you give me something, I give you something back, right? You give me a little something. I got a bathroom now. Cool. 25. Got a kitchen. Another 25. Backyard. I got a basement. Okay, here's another 100000 right? Well, I'm not giving it to you all at once. Because I need you to continue on the path. I need I need to keep the carrot in front of the horse. All right? Everybody know the carrot and, yeah. and, and horse thing, right? Oh. Yeah. The carrot, though, the horse is chasing the carrot, right? We'll never get it till they're done with the ride, right? Until we get to what we get to, then I'll give you the carrot and I give you some sugar or whatever, right? But until it's done, you just look at the carrot, you're gonna chase it all day. And you see, you guys seen cats chasing their tail before? Never going to catch it. I've seen one cat catch its tail once. And then soon they catch it like, ah, it's hair. Okay, I don't want that. Okay? So it's the same thing. Change the reward system up, you'll get um, some change or some, you know, impact on people's um, drive to, to implement the change, right? Not because of anything intrinsic. It's more extrinsic. I'm getting my money up front. I'm getting the reward up front. And so I'm okay with that. Right. So as soon as as long as I see some tangible return or benefit for myself immediately. Okay. All right. Um, link selection, selection decision to change objective, right? So this one's pretty straightforward, right? If I'm doing something and I can attach it to an end goal, people are more likely to, to take it, to go with it, right? Because there's a beginning and there's a foreseeable end, right? If you never notice when you're going someplace and you know where you're going, it's much shorter ride than when you don't know where you're going. Even though you're going to the same place. Okay. Does anybody feel that way? Does anybody even notice that? When you when you know where you're going, I know I'm going to whatever, Chick-fil-A, wherever. Right? I know how to get there. It's gonna take me five minutes. Okay, I'm going to Chick-fil-A, but I've never then been there before. For some reason, it seems like it takes forever, okay? So when people can see the end, in their own mind, they can create their own timeline. They can adjust their schedule to fit that particular path, right, that is conducive to them. When I'm undetermined or don't know or have an unknown, it's very hard for me to kind of come up with a, an individual personalized agenda because I really don't know where I'm going. I don't know how long it's going to take me. Are we going to be here for a month? Are we doing this for a year? What I like, what, what's the end state? And so when you can tie your actions to some clear objective, so clear end state, people tend to kind of like, okay, fine. You know, you have somebody that's just go, you know what? I'm just going to do it now. Like some of you guys, right? It's week seven. I'm pretty sure some of you guys already did Ellie for week eight. Yeah, not everybody. There's some of us, right? Some some overachievers, right? They got the time. I'm gonna do Ellie week eight, Ellie, because you can see it, right? You know what the end, right? Right? Now granted it's not open, right? But if it was open, you would do it. But because it's not open, now you're like, well, when is it gonna be open? I like to get to it. I don't know what's in it, right? We're talking about the final exam. I don't know what's in in in, in week eight, right? But if you open it up and let me see it in my own mind, I can create my own timeline. I can take the steps I need to take, all right, to get there, regardless of your timeline as far as when it needs to be done. We know when the semester ends, all right, but that has nothing to do with your own individual timeline and when you can get it done. If, if we, it was open, 
There's some students, they will do all the work for week eight right now and be done, and then they're done with the class. They're like, no, I'm just waiting for my grade. Two weeks ahead of time, right? They're finished. I have students like that. I have one or two in this class. Not in this class. I mean, they're in this class, but they're online. I have one in particular. He's always does his work a week ahead of time, okay? Problem with that, though, you got to watch out for the quality, right? Because you probably don't have all the answers. You probably have all the information that you need um, to really submit a good product or make the appropriate changes and decisions that you need to make, right? That's that's the problem with being ahead of the game and trying to jump the gun sort of, right? So you have to have a clear understanding of what the end state is and what are the resources in between that, right? Between A to B, right? Um, act consistently with advocated uh, actions, right? Walk the talk, right? Don't say stuff and then do something different. Don't say, I need everyone to be on time. We change the time to be in the office at to eight instead of nine. So that's a new change. And here you come showing up at nine ten. Okay. That doesn't set a good example, right? Be the change that you want to see. Right? If you want to see something different, you do it first. If you do it first, people are going to be like, oh, the boss did it or such and such did it. Okay, let me follow through, right? Because if you don't, you're going to lose credibility. If I tell you to be work at eight instead of nine and I show up at nine, first is going to come off like I'm special. First thing, the boss or not, right? Then I'm going to lose credibility because you're like, you're a hypocrite. You're not following, you're not saying, you're asking us to do this, but you won't do it yourself, right? So why should I put any effort into changing? Why should I try to do this for you? Right? Because it's not really for me, it's for you. It's for the company. So I don't, I'm not going to do it if you're not going to do it. Right? And a lot of people like that, okay? So you have to make sure you walk the talk, okay? Encourage voluntary acts of initiative, okay? Give people, and this one, this one's really hard because it's very specific to individual personalities. We have some managers, they're very micromanaging, right? They're very hands-on, they're in your business, they're telling you how to drink, eat, talk, okay? They're very specific, right? We have micromanagers. And there's other bosses who are very lazy fair, right? I don't care how you do it, just get it done. Okay, as long as it's done legally and it's done the way I want, I don't, I don't really care how you do it, right? So you want to make sure that you can tell your workforce, like, hey, I'm going to empower you to make decisions, okay? And we, you know, sometimes I think some of you talk about empowerment, and we talk about empowerment in some of the um, LEs. Empowerment is a very powerful tool. If I give you the ability to make decisions about things that you know are important to you, important to the class, important to your grade, right? And I give you some leeway, then you feel more vested. You feel like you're part of the, the process more, right? And so I want you to take those chances. I want you to, hey, take the initiative. If you see that this is not right and you know it's supposed to be this way, just do it. I I'm not going to get mad at you, especially if you can say, hey, uh, Dr. K, it said, the perfect example is the rubric, right? Everybody always says, hey, Dr. K, um, the rubric said this, but I know you said this, right? And then you ask me, like, what do I need to follow? You ask me that question because you're like, I'm confused, right? What, what's going to give you my A at the end of the day, right? And I'll tell you that, yes, the rubric is a guide. And I understand if you use the rubric, I will never fail you. That's the whole point. If you use the rubric and you don't listen to what I said, you can always fall back on the rubric. The rubric said this. I didn't hear what you said, Dr. Case, but I know what the rubric says. And so I followed the rubric. I have no place to go, but to go, you're right. I got to grade you on the rubric. Because you follow the rules. You did what you're supposed to do, right? And so you have to make sure that you, you know, give people a leeway to make decisions, right, that they kind of make on their own. You want to promote empowerment. You want to promote uh, 
critical thinking, right? You don't want people to just kind of follow the herd or just be part of the masses and see something happening and don't take any action when it's clearly like something needs to be done, right? At some point, everybody is a leader, right? Leadership shifts depending on situations. Sometimes, even in this class, when I'm up here, I'm the leader, I'm talking. The minute you start talking, you're the leader, okay? The minute Toji has a comment or anybody else has a comment, you are not the leader of the class because we're, you're guiding us. We're, I'm following you, all right? Because then that leads to other conversations, all right? And so now you become the de facto leader. I take my leadership back, Right. Once you're done talking, I take it back because I have to kind of proctor the class and guide us through the, the discussion. But at the end of the day, each one of us become the leader when the minute we start taking an active role in whatever the process is. Right. And so don't be afraid to promote that. Don't be afraid to let your people know, like, hey, any one of us could be a leader. If you have an idea, you see something, take the initiative and go. And this is something that, you know, comes kind of naturally for, not naturally, but it's something that's pushed in the military. I'm not in my off base here, right? Initiative, 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 right? Especially in the military, right? Who's in the military? Who's in the military? <laughs> no. Who's in the military? I got a military guy here. No. Who is it? No, nobody remember? Anyway, I know there's a military person here, right? But in the military, it's very much, hey, Take the initiative because if I give you the power to take the initiative, I'm not there when whatever it is that's going on, right? I'm not there. You're there, okay? You're where the rubber meets the road. And so for you to have to go back to me and say, you know what? I'm coming to this, I'm at this decision point and I need you to tell me what to do. Well, I don't know what to tell you because I'm not there, first thing. Second, you probably should duck and get your guys out. If you get shot at, probably not a good time to call me. You probably want to assess the situation, take the initiative and make a decision about how am I going to get out of here alive, okay? How am I going to make sure that the company doesn't lose a million dollars because I've made a bad trade? How am I going to make sure we don't have some supply distribution issues because I see that these guys, this supply distribution logistics company is not that great. I'm going to decide to kind of talk to the boss about, hey, we need to change some things up because you're in the midst of it. I'm not, right? And so if you're missed in the midst of it, you're in a situation, you need to speak up. All right, measure progress, okay? Always got to have some measurements, right? Always got to be able to say, you know, this is what, you know, it looks like we're at 50%, 60%, or 10% of the workforce, or whatever the case may be, right? You always have to have some metric, okay? Celebrate and route, right? Means don't wait till the end to have one big, like, oh, we did it, right? You should celebrate every little victory, right? If something goes well, milestone number one, goal number one, no matter how big or small it is, good job. Way to go. I like that, all right? Sometimes I'll come in here and say, you know what? This week's LE, you guys did really well. I like that. Good feedback. I like this kind of thing, right? I could wait till week in the week eight and say, you know, this was a great class. So you guys did great work and that kind of thing, right? I could. But I try to tell you every week or once in a while in between the eight weeks, hey, this was good work. Or um, you guys didn't do so great here. And pick this up, okay? What you want to celebrate all the little victories as much as you can, right? Not wait to the end for the grand finale. And then fine tune, right? Once you get the feedback, you get kind of, you know, an understanding of what the challenges are, some of the deficiencies or some of the kinks in your process, then you go in and you tweak them, right? If we need to change A to B, we change it to B, right? If we need to change the hours and it makes sense, Okay, five more minutes. All right, let's change the five minutes or something like that. All right, but you have to be aware of the situation. You have to be aware of the surrounding the circumstances and the resources that you're available, so that you can make this, these uh, kind of tuning changes. Right, and we do a lot of tuning in in when you code. You tune a lot. Okay, you go into the algorithms and you change certain parameters. Right, and I'm, I know a lot of you are not real versed with with uh, coding and that kind of thing, but there's a tuning 
function or tuning um, piece that we do, right? How fast is the algorithm going? If you're doing a neural network, how fast is it going through, right? It's evolutions, right? How quick is it learning? The learning rate, that kind of thing, okay? And so you go and you fine tune because sometimes you need to slow stuff down, sometimes you need to speed it up, right? So it depends. All right. You out of here? Okay. All right. Later. Yes, break. 10 minutes. Come on back. Okay. 10 minute break. If you're leaving, you're leaving, but 10 minutes. I'm saying for the people that are coming back to class, yes, yeah, we're not done yet. 10 minute break. If you are staying, come back to class. You need to leave. You're grown adults. I'm not telling you to leave. Just, you can go if you need to leave. Okay. On your own accord. Okay. Okay. No, you know why? Yeah. You know why? Yeah. 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 When you get to the garage, that other door you guys know what I'm talking about, to the right, yeah, they, they go to that door, and they, they both look alike, though. Okay, good. Yep. Okay.
Absolutely, if you go to John. Yeah. yeah, I mean, sometimes you gotta do that. And then you gotta look at your situation like, all right, I need to. Yeah. 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 Ye
So, I mean, all, both of those are correct. Um, the thing with, you know, the landscape now, as we, as we know it, due to globalization, you know, multinational corporations, you know, everybody wanting to be global and have a hand in everything that's going on, right? Uh, the benefits are one thing, but you also have to take into consideration the, um, the disadvantages, the challenges that come with that, right? So the things that occur here in the United States have an impact in other countries, although they have really nothing to do with what's going on in those countries per se, but they have an impact on you know, the, the commerce, the manufacturing, the finance, you know, all, all these worlds kind of collide and intersect uh, when you really don't think about it, right? Uh, but so as a you know, board or as leaders, you have to think of it in that scope, right? And at the macro level, at the high level, you know, okay, how am I going to operate in this really undetermined and um, dynamic and fluid space, right? And we're talking about, we're not talking about like positive changes. We're talking about things that are very um, hazardous and um, dangerous at the end of the day, right? War, famine, you know, lack of resources, um, you know, civil war, those kind of things, right? And so having a, a pulse on those things is important. This is why sometimes, you know, it's it's important for me to kind of convey to you guys about keeping a, 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 a pulse or kind of keeping in tune with what's going on, right? I know watching the news is depressing, right? It's not something I would do on a day-to-day -day basis, but at least listening and understanding, okay, there are things going on that are going to impact globally, right? And in a owner or a business or a CEO of an entity, right? What's that going to do to my company, right? And how do I set things up in which I can either, you know, address those issues, deal with them, or just go around them all together, right? Uh, but I have to keep a vigilant eye and understand, like, somebody has to be on watch, is really what is going down in boiling knots, right? Somebody has to keep a, an eye on it at every moment of the day, right? Because now it's nighttime here, but in other countries, it's day, right? The stock market is open, commerce is going on, things they're doing are going to impact us tomorrow morning, okay? And so, you know, the real objective here with the article is to give you some insight of, you know, some of the thoughts that the leaders of these big companies go through, right? Mark Zuckerberg, Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, you know, these kind of guys who are definitely on the global scale, right? How do they deal with some of this, you know, um, censorship, right, issues? How does Apple deal with China's dominance and their inability to um, penetrate that cellular market, right? That the cell phone market there. Um, how do we combat the Middle East and not necessarily combat, but how do we deal with the, you know, OPEC? In Saudi Arabia with their control of the oil and then decreasing their production, right? What does that do to us as a company, right? As an entity, right? And so we have to kind of categorize things in a certain way, right? So that we know the, the severity of the challenge that we're looking at and what type of challenge is it and what do we need to do to counteract um, that particular challenge, right? So what's the first challenge or first perspective they have? An article, right? Unpredictability, right? And anybody, and black swan the term has been around for a long time, right? Something you just don't see coming, you don't, you know, don't know what it's like. And have you, have you guys ever seen the movie Black Swan? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a movie Black Swan it's with Natalie Portman, and she's a, a ballerina dancer, I think. But it's a remake. It's the, the concept is old, um, but within the uh, the movie. She's under so much pressure that she starts to crack, sort of, and she goes into these different personalities, and it's it's weird, right? She's very unpredictable. You don't know what she's gonna do. And she like morphs. Yes, he morphs. Yeah, he goes through the transition, sort of. Black. black to the black swan, right? She physically dark. morphs. Yeah, she's dark. Yeah, she turns from a nice, light person, very bright and entertaining, and kind of like engaging to this black dark person that just is just capable of doing all kinds of stuff, right? And so when you look at that from that lens, you know, as a CEO, what are those things that are looming that you know you're gonna they're gonna be black swan, 
right? I can't control, again, the you know the economy in certain countries. I can't control the, the civil strife, okay? I can't control a lot of things in other places. I must have control them here, right? And so we have to plan for those black swan events. We have to be ready for them. And it's probably one of the more difficult scenarios to prepare for because, again, did anybody here know COVID was coming? Yeah, right? We didn't know COVID was coming. COVID was unpredictable. And it's been, what, two, three years now, right? We have a vaccine. And I talked to Christina about this once in a while. I don't know what the vaccine does. I don't know what's going to happen in the next five years to people that took the vaccine, right? People that did take the vaccine. It's unpredictable, right? So there's considered a black swan effect, uh, uh, event. But how did that affect companies? Right? Some companies closed, went bankrupt. Other companies make billions. Okay? So their planning is different, right? Their perspective on whether this is a black swan event and was it beneficial to us, was black swan event and was it detrimental to us, are two different things, right? Right? Zoom, for instance, made the most money ever made in their life during COVID because that's what we needed. We had the resource, they used it, they leveraged it, they made great money, but now the demand is starting to decrease, going back to normal, like normalizing again, because we don't have that necessary need to get back into our normal routine, right? But another company, let's say Peloton, for instance, all right, everybody familiar with Peloton? So you see the commercial on TV, it's the bike, and it has the the the, the, the screen on it, and you, the instructor's live, and you see him on the bike. You know, it's an exercise bike. Yeah, it's a Peloton. So it's it was it's pretty expensive. I don't know, fifteen hundred dollars or whatever the case may be. During COVID, they were selling. You couldn't get one. They were selling like hotcakes. Like you just you just could not find one, right? The mistake they made though was that they planned their five six year plan on their COVID projection, their COVID revenue, okay? Bad idea, we're not gonna be in COVID forever. People are not gonna be at home working out like that. You know, once the gyms reopened, everybody was back in the gyms, right? Outside, running, whatever the case may be. Well, guess what happened to Peloton? Peloton basically took a big loss, huge. Surplus inventory, no place to go with it, okay? waste of money and they have all these plans they made all these decisions based on that okay really bad leadership in my opinion right you have to understand that although it's a black swan event it's temporary in nature right is there unpredictability yes that's the, that's the inherent nature of the black swan event but you also know that it's going to come to an end right there's some information about it so making decisions you know, you got to be smart about, okay, I really don't know where it's going to end. I really don't know all the facets of it, but I know it's going to end at some point, and I can't really make decisions based on that, right? And so as a leader, you got to take that perspective. All right, what's the next one they talk about? Uh, gray rhinos, right? Yeah. What are gray rhinos? You just don't know the magnitude of the problem, right? And, yeah, you know it's there, you see it. Anybody ever seen a rhino live in person and, you know, you don't get too close to them because they they get, well, that's hippos, hippopotamus are temperamental. Rhinos, I don't know. I never touched one before. Uh, I've seen them before, but from a distance, right? I don't want to get ran over by a rhino, okay? But you see them, they're big, especially a gray rhino, you're like, that thing, you can't miss it, all right? But you really don't know how it's going to behave. Right, you know it, it. It does certain things, but yeah, I'm not really sure if the situation changes. If this rhino is going to get violent on me, or if this situation is going to get a little more uh, hostile, right? And so you have to understand that also and plan for those things. But that's easy to plan for because you know the nature of the rhino, sort of, right? You know if you don't do A, it's not going to do B. Okay, you know you do C, it's going to do D. Right, and so you can plan a little better for that. And you can see the change coming, right? You see the change coming, 
and it's right in front of you. Anybody else can see it. And you can plan better, right? It's a visible, for the most part, you can see the front. You may not see the back. You may not see all the way around 360, but you have a general idea of what it is that you're dealing with, right? And so it helps you to allocate resources better, helps you to plan better, okay? And it's probably the one of the situation that isn't so bad where, okay, I can, you know, I can figure it out. Okay, I can figure it out. Not like a black swan event where I'm totally in the dark and it's like, okay, good luck. All right. What's the third perspective? I don't think yeah. So, so the Russia Ukraine issue. Yeah. Can we say that's a gray Can we say it's a gray uh, I mean at this point, yeah, you can kind of say it's gray. It's a rhino, but at the same time, because you don't really know a lot about what Russia's doing, like Russia's very tight knit. You know, it's like China. It's like asking somebody, "What's China doing?" Or North Korea. Or North Korea. Yeah. No, no. We we you know we speculate, we assume, but you know we see it, right? Um, and it could be more categorized as a gray rhino when it comes to China, but Russia, I think, is still more a black swan because there's so much unpredictability around it, and we really have no control as to what's happening. The only control that we have is by influencing Ukraine, right? And even that relationship, you got to tiptoe, right? Because there's different things you don't want to do. You don't want to, you know, you know, there's a reason why we haven't provided certain types of equipment to the Ukrainians, because if the United States is seen providing high grade, super duper weapons to the Ukrainians, then we picked the side sort of already, but now we're kind of injecting ourselves into the war. So now, what that does is what it's doing kind of now is letting the Russians say, okay, cool, you want to join the Ukrainians? Great, we're going to call to China. And you see what's going on, right? China and Russia, buddy, buddy. They've always been buddy, buddy, you know, but now they're really buddy, buddy, right? They're going fishing, they're doing all kinds of stuff, horseback riding, they're eating at each other's house, kids are coming over to play. It's, it's a whole different situation, right? And so it's still, to me, kind of a black swan thing because we, don't have any influence on it, except on the Ukrainian front. And even still, you know, uh, we're not the only ones. There's other people, other countries involved. So it makes it a little bit not as tenuous, you know, but we are the primary supplier of, you know, weapons to them. So it's it's kind of in the middle sort of at this point. Right? And hopefully it comes to an end and becomes, you know, um, I don't know. A silver lining, right? And then, yeah, get to the silver lining. What's the silver lining? Uh, Talk about. Right, right. There's always opportunities, right? There's an opportunity in everything. Just like COVID, when I said, hey, it was it sucked for one company, opportunity for another. Okay. And just like Russia with uh, Ukraine, it sucks in general, right? But as the article stated, and you can see it, it's prompted other countries to look at different alternatives for fuel, for energy, right? Because our reliance on Russian oil, right, is very evident now, right? It's evident that there's a lot of countries that rely on Russia for their oil. And we have still countries that are going, you know, behind our back or behind the global, you know, world's back or whatever, and buying oil from Russia when it's not, you're not supposed to, right? There's a big sanction. But you're not supposed to buy oil from Russia, right? At overinflated prices, right? You're supposed to keep it, it's supposed to be a certain price and below market, right? Because they're trying to cripple the economy, is what they're trying to do. They're trying to cripple the Russian economy, right? So Russia has figured out a couple of different ways in which they like you. Yeah. But Russia, they have a silver lining in this too, in that they realized, like, hey, we have figured out how to fund this war without going to traditional conventional means. Because all of Russia's money is frozen for the most part. That's in the World Bank and that kind of thing. It's tied up. They're not going to get it. So what they're doing is they're using Bitcoin. They're using cryptocurrency to fund the war. They're going that route, which is, again, not anything we can control. Right? We can't even control cryptocurrency here. Unless they're trying to do it internationally. It doesn't, it doesn't work. So there's a silver lining in that aspect, right? But overall, you know, for the nation, we again can see that 
most countries will come together when they see that something wrong is happening, right? Russia invading Ukraine is not right, right? It's, 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 not, it's not something you should do, right? And so countries are uniting, but as the silver lining for, you know, looking at different alternative, you know, energy sources and that kind of thing, that's the silver lining that, you know, has presented itself for us, right? And increased and better relations with other countries around us, right? Because we have a common goal in head. Okay. So if you guys want to read the article, kind of get a, an idea of the kind of the things that are being, you know, the term being tossed around, you know, in corporate boardrooms and, that, and, and those things, right? That's more relevant and up to date as to how CEOs look at things and how leadership looks at things from a global perspective uh, when taking into consideration some of the crises that are going on around the world, right? Even here with the shootings, right? Other countries look at the United States and go, why do you guys have so many shootings, right? But when you look at the United States on our gun policies and how we handle it and how other countries handle it, it's totally different. So you have to expect that you're going to have a higher rate of gun incidents if you allow guns. If you have a country where guns aren't allowed, unless you're on the military, law enforcement, or some special capacity, then if you have a gun on you, you're probably going to get arrested, right? You know, most countries, Philippines, I think Africa, I think Middle East, I'm not sure, you know, so, you know, you can't have a gun. It's illegal to have a gun. Right? Makes it very easy. You got a gun? Arrest him. What do you do? Nothing, I'm a farmer. <laughs> well, you might need a gun, right? But that's a special circumstance, right? But in general, don't have a gun, right? But it impacts other things around the world. Because when you talk about why do you know we kind of don't um, necessarily have a lot of serious gun control, there's so many industries tied into the gun market that it just... It, it would kill that it would kill that industry okay and it would kill other industries worldwide right because a lot of resources that go into making guns right you got the powder we're just talking about the, the sheer material just to make bullets and rounds i'm not even talking about the actual weapon itself right the steel the all the different minerals and different compounds that go into it. where do these come from where do you source those things from right that may be sourced from a little city, town, you know, in Nigeria, you know, and if we take that away, that, that town goes away, okay? And so there's different things that inter intersect that we don't really pay attention to uh, in our day-to-day -day life, right? But CEOs and, you know, once you get your big company, you start thinking about how being impacted, even small companies, right? On a global level, right? Um, just for instance, I have a project I'm probably coming up. It's in Nigeria. But one of the concerns about doing the project is that it's in Nigeria. And so from a, a U.S. domestic standpoint, it's it's on a certain alert level, yeah. right? Yeah. It's alert three, I think. Right. right, it's alert three, right? We're going to Abuja. It's alert three. Now, I've been to a few places around the world, been alert three, four, five, whatever. And I'm like, okay, there's nothing going on here. It's, it, it's, it's relative to, to you know, your experiences, right? Because people will go to New York and say, oh my God, New York is dangerous, right? I grew up in New York, it's not dangerous, right? It, to me, it's not scary. But if you're coming from a different place, you say, oh my God, watch your pocket, don't go here, don't, tr don't trust anybody, right? When you go to New York, you're gonna be paranoid, you're gonna be a little nervous, right? You may not even go, okay? So that's having an impact on whether or not we're going to take this project on, right? Because it's a great project. I want to go. I think it'll be a good experience for me and the team and that kind of thing. But at the same time, you know, they're worried about that. I'm like, nothing is going on in Abuja that's going to, you're not going to die, okay? It's okay. It's going to be all right, okay? Okay, that's all we got. Appreciate you guys sticking around. Go home. And then I'll see you guys next week, okay? Last week. Last Thank week. you. All right, we out of here. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. All right, see you later.